Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. And if you haven't already yet subscribed to the podcast, please do so. We would love to have you as part of our community. And you can do it for free through your favorite podcast apps, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and through our website, which is www.culinaryschoolstories.com, which is also where we store all of the guest bios, the show episodes, so make sure you check that out. Okay, I'd now like to introduce today's guest who not only attended multiple culinary schools, but is a chef and culinary instructor in the United States military, part of his culinary school story. And so without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Chef Ryan Nielsen. Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me, Chef. So first, before we even start, I'd like to thank you for your service and your continued service. We really appreciate that. Thank you, sir. And I know you come from a long line of cooks, including your grandmother and your grandfather. So maybe you could start by telling the listeners, where did your love of food and cooking first begin? And what influence did your grandparents have on you in your career? Well, when I was a child, um, you know, I, I grew, grew up um, around food and in the kitchen. And my grandmother, uh, both of my grandmothers, for that matter, um, were heavily involved in the kitchen and they they did everything they could to impart their their knowledge and their skill set on me. And it was just casual, of course, you know, I was a child. And then uh, my grandfather, uh, my uh, um, my father's dad, uh, he was a cook in the army. And um, and moving forward beyond that, he became an ordained minister in the Lutheran church. And then, wow. Yes. So throughout the years, you know, I, I learned a lot of different styles and, and the, how to develop a passion for cooking from both of my grandmothers and my grandfather on, on, on my dad's side of the family. Now, if, uh, after like high school or so, I'm guessing you, that's when you went into the Marines and you didn't have any inclination that you're going to be doing cooking at that point or did you no not at all actually i i enlisted in the marine corps um what they called at the time open contract so uh you know it was based on my my entrance scores from from the military entrance processing station and then uh when i was in in, an, in another advanced course which is called marine corps combat training that's when i got identified my job and based on my scores, I, I became a cook. And I, I have to be honest, uh, I was initially disappointed, <laughs> regardless of the fact that I love food and love to eat and, and enjoy cooking. At that time, you know, I was 19 years old. I, you know, I was I was really gung ho about being a Marine. So, you know, I wanted to be an infantryman. But uh, lo and behold, you know, I was identified as a cook. And it's, it's, you know, the process has evolved over the years. And, and at the time, uh, you know, it, it kickstarted my career in, in culinary arts. You were looking to hold a gun, not a spatula at the time. Being in <laughs> At the time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then it, you know, that's where you found your, you know, niche. That's where you found your lane there. And so how does that work? I mean, once they identify, you're going to be a mechanic, you're going to be a pilot. You're gonna, well, how, what do you do? You go to a special school to learn that skill, in your case, being a chef? Yes, sir. Uh, so um, it's changed since then. But at that time in... Um, in 1994, the uh, the Marine Corps Food Service Specialist course is what they called it then, uh, took place in North Carolina, and uh, so now it's now all the joint the Joint Services School is where I currently work, uh, which is at Fort Lee, Virginia. It's pr predominantly an Army base, but but all all branches of the service, with exception of the, the United States Coast Guard. 
um, all the uh, initial enlistment um, courses for food service and culinary arts takes place at Fort Lee, Virginia. So oh. I've had the opportunity to work there for the last three and a half years. So going back to when you were trained, it was a little bit different, as you just mentioned. What do they do? They bring you in and, and take us through it because we'll get to you going to culinary school after that. But yes, I'm trying to see, is was it similar to that? I mean, do they start out with like basic knife cuts and then go into the cooking methods? Or how do they teach you in the military? Um, well, yeah, it, it did start out with basic knife cuts and then it moved on to uh, to learning processes and and all the different mother sauces and, and baking principles. It was kind of a, you know, it was a consolidated situation because, you know, the, the military is, is not afforded the same opportunities as, as a culinary institution to where, you know, you can draw it out to, to one to two to three or four years, you know, it's, it's pretty condensed. So they kind of shotgun it, if you will. Mm -hmm. But uh, the curriculum is based pretty, pretty, pretty well. And, uh, so I, I learned from a great foundation in, in my Marine Corps years. And then obviously I attended culinary school and it, and it metamorphosed in further than that since then. So let's, let's talk about that. So you got out of the Marines, you did four years, I did. you get out, then you decided you wanted further culinary training. So you went to culinary school. Where was that? And why did you pick the school you did? Um, I, I, I attended and graduated from Western Culinary Institute, which was located in Portland, Oregon, um, downtown Portland. Um, initially, I chose the school based on affordability. Um, I wanted to go to the California Culinary Academy, but at the time, the um, the what has now become the GI Bill. It, you know, at that time, it was the Montgomery GI Bill, so it wasn't it wasn't too user friendly to the former service members. So. I, I honestly, the the conditions that my my life was in at that time, I couldn't afford the California Culinary Academy. It was, the tuition was too costly, so I chose Western Culinary Institute, and it was a it was a wonderful experience. Um, it was a twelve month condensed program, and um, I primarily focused my my desired curriculum on on the savory side of the culinary arts. So I did have a small introduction to baking and pastry, but but it was more so focused on savory. Now, did they give you any credit for your previous experience in the military learning how to cook or no, they started right from scratch? Um, essentially, they started me from scratch, yes. How was that? You already have four years military, you're not the typical student. Was the other students that you were going to school with, were they like right out of high school or were they career changers as well? For the most part, the, all the all my fellow students were right out of high school. There was a you know there was a handful of of uh, service industry experience individuals and a couple a couple people that had military experience as well. Um, specifically, uh, a very good friend of mine um, to this day. Uh, we were in the Marine Corps together, and, and we were food service specialists in the Marine Corps. He and I went to school together, so we chose to go there at the same time. So you must have had more experience than the typical students that were there. How was that? Did they look to you as like the, you know, give them the mentor, the guidance? Were they hanging on your coattails, or did you just kind of go in and play it low key and learn like everyone else? How, how did it? How did it go through? I mean, you must have been nervous day one. Regardless, tell us about that. Yeah, it it was a little bit of both. Um, I was, you know, I, I myself was nervous just because I was kind of shell shocked and. A little bit intimidated by the skill set of the chef instructors at the school because you know most of them had 20 plus years of service experience. Mm -hmm. um, but my fellow students, yes, that you know, they they tapped into into my friend. Um, his name is Dwayne Alexander. Um, they tapped into he and I a lot for our previous experience, and you know it it was a pretty pretty awesome experience. You know, all around all around. Great. Did you have a favorite class? Did you go in there and go, oh, I love this one or, or a worse class? You know, I, I really loved the the restaurant experience. Like the last the last course of the curriculum, you you know, you were just like most culinary institutions, you know, you work in a in a, in a restaurant that's serving to the public and that gave us a, a real live experience of of how it will be moving forward in the industry. And so that was my favorite. Ah. 
Is there a class that you had in culinary school that you or a class that was missing? Does you wish you like, wow, you know, I, I wish they would have taught us this or I wish I got a little more of this in class or was it just what you expected and just what you needed? Um, for the most part, it was what what was expected. However, I will say, um, speaking to what you're you're mentioning, I I really wish looking back on it now after all these years, I wish I would have had more more instruction on garmage. Mm. And how so? Did you find that you that you needed that when you got out there in the industry, or just something that was like missing? Yeah, I, I thought my. My my skill set and my knowledge base of of working with garmage out in the industry was not quite on par with with the people that were already experienced in in that in that realm. Hmm. Now that school is it still there? Are they sold or, or do you know anything? Do you ever go back to it? Are you still in touch with the school? Um, I, I I've reached out to them in the past, but they they're no longer in operation. No. Okay. All right. So you got your. Four years in, in military, and then you got another year of experience in your culinary school. And mm -hmm. what happened next? What happened? You just you went in the industry. Did they they require you to do some kind of internship, or did you find it on your own? Yeah, I did an internship um, for for about four months um, at um, the Double Tree Hotel at, at Jansen Beach in Portland, Oregon, and. I ended up getting hired on after the internship, and I worked in the uh, Hayden Island Steakhouse there for for about a year and a half, and uh, I was the lead cook. Um, you know, based on my my skill set and my experience, you know, they hired me as the lead cook. Um, and then um, after that, I had a seven year break in service, and from the Marine Corps to the Army. Uh, I got out of the Marine Corps in 98 and I joined the Army in 2005. But during that seven year uh, time frame in between, I worked as a sous chef uh, at the New York, New York Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. Wow. Yeah. I, so I worked for I worked for about one year there and it was an awesome experience. Um, you know, it was a great, great, great position. And but at the same time, I was. I was missing something. So, you know, being that I served four years in the Marine Corps, I, I felt as though something wasn't fulfilled in what I was doing on a daily basis. And I really wanted to go back into the military. So I, I decided to join the Army because at that time, the Marine Corps was, were not accepting prior service. Hmm. Um, so I, I figured, you know, I'd, I'd give it a shot and see what the Army had to offer and uh, I was able to enlist and, and do the same craft of being being a chef in the military and and here I am 16 years later <laughs> that is tremendous so help help the listener help me understand what it is cooking in the what you go through and how does that relate to what we might see in a restaurant or a hotel you know is it is it the same how is it different uh, you know Take us a little bit through that and, you know, paint us a little bit of a picture. Sure. Uh, a lot of it depends on the location. So some places are afforded, you know, a better budget than other locations in, in the military. So like, for example, um, there, there's a, a program within all branches of the service, which is called the enlisted aid program. So when you're an enlisted aid, you're, you're E5 and above typically E6 and above, which is the sixth rank, obviously, um, of the enlisted ranks. And you'll, you'll be the personal chef, if you will, of a general, a general officer. So, and how that works is typ typically it's a two, uh, a two, two star general and above. Um, and then you'll be in support of, uh, his mission on a daily basis and, and, have the opportunity to serve meals and create menus. And when you, when you are an enlisted aid, which I a hundred percent transparency, I've not been an enlisted aid. However, the, the section that I've worked in for the last three years, we train them in culinary arts to prepare them to be able to cook for, for the general officer and any entertaining uh, guests that they might have in their events. So uh, pretty, pretty awesome. But you could also be cooking for the 
the masses, you know, or maybe in a tent in a battlefield or in a submarine or, you know. Abs- yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, th- th- and there's, a there's a, you know, a lot of different variables to that. You could be out in, in a field environment, in a combat environment, cooking in, in field tents and also, you know, in, in garrison environments, which is, you know, non-war time, uh, depending on the, the military installation, you know, some of them are more geared for for being uh, in a congruent comparison to to a, a civilian restaurant, and some of them are more mess hall based. But mm-hmm. but now with with the uh, trying trying to tra- transfer to being more more geared towards uh, being competitive with the civilian sector, a lot of military installations and all all fi- all the branches of service. Are, are are doing every effort to set up our our dining facilities up like restaurants in the civilian sector. Hmm. Now, do you have civilian operators? I guess you must have like fast food type places on the bases, or do you have you know other companies coming in? There are there are competitive there are, yes there are there are, there is competition and there's a lot of competition that takes place. So that's why uh, the the all the military restaurants. You know they have to be have to be flexible to be able to to adapt to that to to compete with the other civilian agencies that are are on the installation and around the surrounding areas too. Sure, Clay. So now you have. How did you get to become a teacher, an instructor, a culinary or chef instructor of others that want to go into this? You were first out there being a chef yourself in in, in the field, I guess, or in, for generals and yes, stuff. Sir. But now you've gone to where you train others. How does that happen? Do they just pick someone, or is that something you have to apply for? No, it, it's it's an application process, and uh, so at the time, uh, back in 2013. Uh, I was stationed at Fort Bliss, which is located in El Paso, Texas. And um, based on a prior experience that I had when I was stationed in Germany, uh, I knew a, a military chef that he was, very, you know, senior. He was a sergeant major, which is an E9. And I, I had reached out to him and I asked him, you know, what what could I do to be more competitive, to be able to get assigned to, to the military um, cooking school? at Fort Lee. And, um, he, he was in the process at the time of going to transition to become a civilian and retire from his military career. So he referred me to a, 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 a fellow Sergeant major of his to reach out to. And I did, I reached out to her and, um, you know, I sent her all my documentation, you know, mapping out my previous experience, both civilian and my military. And then I submitted an application to, to get selected for it and and God blessed me with being selected for it. And I've been I've been stationed here at Fort Lee in Virginia twice, but two totally separate experiences. So the first time I was stationed here uh was from um December 2013 and I was here for two and a half years. So I I worked in the initial enlistment. Um so teaching the students that just came into the army and the Marine Corps and the Air Force and the Navy to learn how to become culinary specialists in the military. And then this time I've been here for three and a half years working in the Advanced Culinary Skills Training Division. And I've been one of the uh, instructors in the Advanced Culinary Skills Training course, teaching fellow NCOs that for the most part, not all, but for the most part, most of them were training them to to be enlisted aides to general officer. Wow. So the first batch, they may have wanted to be culinarians or not. They may have just got that's their area, right? So you're teaching them basic. Correct. They might go out and work in the field. And then the next level is the Correct. advanced. They've already been in the field. They're coming back now to take a step up and maybe work for generals or other people as their private chefs. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Wow. So what do you teach them? I mean, you must have all types of food. Do you get high level stuff do you get lobster and steak and caviar is it all more like uh you know what we would think of maybe military food more no sustaining food yeah no not at all actually um you know we're we're afforded you know it's regulated of course but we're we're afforded a budget that allows for us to teach teach a curriculum based on it's based on 
it's not, you know, borrowing from, but it's based on the platform of the Culinary Institute of America um, because there's a partnership between the Culinary Institute of America and, by way of a program in the, in the Army called the Training with the Industry Program, which I was afforded the opportunity to be a participant in, and that was a 12-month program. We can come back to that in a minute, but um, so the curriculum is based based off of the the foundation of CIA's program. So, you know, we teach garmage, we teach appetizers and hors d'oeuvres, menu development, uh, nutritional aspects to, to be able to know, not just to provide meals, but to understand how to provide meals that are nourishment that will be ideal for, you know, physical readiness being that we're in the military. And so then you went to get further training. You just alluded to that a little bit. And that was at the Culinary Institute of America. And you went there for a year to get further training? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so I went to the to the San Antonio, Texas campus. And uh, I, I was there as a student slash apprentice. And I was there for one year. And it was a phenomenal experience. Now, now if you're not familiar with the the CIA San Antonio campus, they they, they only have um, an associate degree program, so it's a two year program. And you know, being that you're there on, on under this training with the industry program, you're there for twelve months. Uh, so you get you kind of get shotgunned in some degree because the the two year program is condensed in one year, but you have an opportunity while you're there to be able to experience everything on their curriculum. And it was like, I, I can't, I can't speak to it enough, like how amazing of an experience it really was. Now, how had that training cha changed or evolved or was better or worse than what you first went through at culinary school out in Oregon? Well, it, it, it really just kind of, it brought me back in my mindset to being able to build off of what I already knew and then propelled it to, to learning other techniques and levels of, of different uh, abilities to be able to execute that I just, I was like, wow, where have I been all these years? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first time going through it, sometimes you don't catch it or see the right. magnitude of it or really grasp it. And then when you go back with a, you know, a little more maturity and a frame of mind, you can say, now this is important. And now I understand it a little more. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Yeah, that's a great campus. I've, I've toured that before and, and spent a little bit of time there in San Antonio. It's really nice. Yeah, it it's, it's a beautiful campus. Unfortunately, I haven't been to the New York campus, but I'd, I'd like to go there just, if, if anything, just to visit it. Yeah, yeah. So you work with different branches in there, right? You're training different, except for the Coast Guard, but you're training Navy and Air Force. And um, who has the better food? Are you allowed to say that? Or is, <laughs> is it they all the same? Who's the better cooks? <laughs> Oh man, um, you know, across the board, all all the branches are are pretty well trained. Um, but I will say, different branches have have a better focus on certain things than others. And the Air Force and the Navy, they have a, a better focus. I I hate to admit it, they have a better focus on the culinary arts programs. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know, but. Uh, but the Army and the Marine Corps are definitely, we're right behind them. <laughs> we're catching up to them. Now, I know they have inter-military competitions, right? They have culinary competitions. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I can. Uh, so I've been afforded the opportunity to be involved with that, um, let me think, five times um, in, in my five years, you know, intermittent of being stationed at Fort Lee. So there's been 46, uh, it's changed names over the years, but currently it's called the Joint Culinary Training Exercise and it's sanctioned by the American Culinary Federation. Um, now amidst the, the coronavirus um, COVID-19 pandemic, that's, you know, been global, this particular year coming up, it would typically take place in the first week of August However, um, it's not happening this year due to that. Right. But um, so it, there's been 46 of them. And then how it works is the military competitors that, that participate in it, they represent all the armed forces at the annual culinary competition that takes place at various locations. The last one took place in, in Orlando, Florida. And how do they get picked to be the competitors to represent their branch? 
So at, at the joint culinary training exercise, it's judged and evaluated by, by certified master chefs from the American Culinary Federation. And the winners get selected by them at the military competition. And then the winners of the military joint culinary training exercise represent the United States Armed Forces competing with the other regions around the United States that, that win their regions from the ACF. Mm. And then what is the grand prize? Just a trophy, bragging rights? Do they, what, what, do, what do they win? It's, it's, it's a little bit all-encompassed. There, there is a trophy, and they, they get recognition um, within the, the industry. And um, this, the most recent competition, the ACF National Competition, um, it was the first time that the United States military was able to participate in the pastry category. And the uh, the representative from the army uh, won the ACF national competition. Wow! In in the inaugural participation of the military in that event. So you know, lo and behold, I'm sure you can imagine like <laughs> that got a lot of recognition in the military. Yeah, because I remember one years back, sometime the some of the winners of one of the competitions, military branches, got to come for a week to Johnson and Wales University's Miami campus and train with us chef instructors. And that was just wonderful for them and for us to have them in our kitchen. Oh sure. So that must have been one of the prizes or something, the rewards that they may they get to have. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I wasn't aware of that before. That's awesome. Yeah. And I don't understand how they stay so clean. Do you guys train them that? Because I can't get my students to be that clean. But I think it's because they stay six inches away from the table. They don't get it on their jackets. <laughs> they are just spotless all throughout the day working. Yeah. You know, like our 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 mindset in, in military food service and culinary arts is, is to be as clean as possible at all times. So you know, obviously, mise en place takes place and clean as you go. But, uh, you know, you got to kind of the way we think about it is we treat cleanliness next to godliness. So if, if you're not clean and you're and you're not sanitary to the fullest extent of 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 that mindset, like you're doing something wrong. They were amazing. I mean, they, they were all at the tables, you know, we're making tomato sauce, we're doing all kinds of things. And they were <laughs> spotless from when they walked in to when they walked out. I'm like, wow, good for you guys <laughs> and ladies. Absolutely. Now, one of the things they gave me was one of these coins. Maybe you could talk about the coins, the quartermaster. Is that the department? I don't know if you can see that coin there. And they gave me this as being one of their instructors. Oh, yeah. I'm familiar with that coin. I'm familiar with that. Definitely. They said, you carry this with you. And then if someone, you know, um, <laughs> challenges you, is this a challenge coin? Is that what this is? Yeah, it, it, it can be used at, as such as a challenge coin. So the, the way it works, um, you know, typically – uh, you'll get presented a coin for excellence in whatever you're whatever you're doing in your job and in your skill set. So um, the quartermaster is it's a branch in the military, um, not to be confused with the Army and the Marine Corps, the Navy's and so on and so forth. Um, it, it, it's a the quartermaster encompasses all the logisticians. So anybody involved with logistics our quartermaster. So, you know, it's, it's supply specialists and, and culinary arts. And, uh, you, you get presented a coin of excellence by, by someone in the command position. So anybody that's captain or above and a captain is O three, um, all the way up to a general officer. And, um, uh, so you just get recognized for for your performance in your in your job in your job duties. So I was pretty honored to get this from them at the end of the week of training. Then, yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, definitely, definitely. They're not they're not easy to come by. <laughs> well, I've kept it a lot of the years, but it you know it says you know, right on there. You know the uh, U.S. Army Quartermaster Center in school and commanding general and you know these great pictures on there and flags and stuff. So you know I I cherish it. That's awesome. I, I, I definitely love that for sure. <laughs> I recognize the insignia on it, definitely. Oh, yeah, that, that's the quartermaster crest and then the, uh, the, the quartermaster commandant, which is the one star, that's, that's their insignia. And then that the, on the other side of it, the side facing you now, oh, there we go, that's the 23rd Brigade uh, insignia on the right. Wow. So 
That was when they came to our school here in Miami, and I got to spend a week with them and training them and working with them in the kitchen. It was a good time. Very cool. Very cool. So now your time in the military is almost up. You've put in over 20 years or be 20 years. What are you going to do next? What's your next plans? What are you going to do with your your, your skill set? Well, I'd like to I'm, – I'm currently um, – uh, you know, I, obviously, I've attained my my culinary arts education, um, but I'm currently a student at Purdue University Global doing uh, an Associate of Applied Science in, in Business Administration. And I'm almost done with that curriculum. I, I have four classes to go. Um, I'm in a current class now. And then after I, I complete that, I have four more classes. And then when I, when I do transition in the civilian sector, I want to further my further my education and uh, pursue a bachelor's. Um, I don't have a, a specified plan. It's changed over the years. Um, mm -hmm. So right now, I, I just know that I want to pursue a bachelor's degree. Um, I don't know if I want to go towards culinary arts or business, but you know, being in this business program on the associates, it's really really opened up my my senses and my horizons to to the business aspect. So I'm interested in that definitely. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Ultimately, uh, I've said a lot to get to the one point that I would like to I, I would like to open a food service establishment, maybe a a, a deli or a bistro is what I, I'd like to have for my family and me. Great. I'm married with two daughters, so it, it would be pretty awesome to be able to you know when, my, when our daughters get a little bit older, they can come out of school and come to the come to the bistro and be like, hey, man, my dad's the chef, the chef owner of this place. <laughs> Very good. That's that's great. Do you do you find a lot of the, you know, people that you've worked with or that you know that leave the military with their food service, their chef, their culinary background? Do they stay in the business? Do they stay on open restaurants, go work in the civilian arena? A lot a lot of the a lot of my colleagues have stayed in the arena. Um, I'd say probably it's about 60 percent, um, generally speaking, stay in the arena and about 40 percent, you know, venture out and do other things. So, yes. Hmm, good. Um, talking about the military, now that you've been in it for so long and you look back on it with, you know, perspective and stuff, how does the military impact the lifestyle and conditions for your family? Um, you know, most of it is positive. Some of it, um, I don't want to say negative. But some of it is challenging, uh, you know, because we're at the at the mercy of the Department of Defense, you know. So, you know, sometimes we get assigned to duty stations uh, and assignments that aren't necessarily conducive for the dynamic of our family. So we just have to, you know, pray and hope that our families um, understand and and we can all be flexible collectively. And so it's not always easy, uh, obviously. Um, so you, ju you just really have to be flexible and, and be ready to to adjust in, in certain areas where you need to. Because people that go on those deployments for long months at a time, that's got to be really hard. And you're at least blessed that, you know, you're there teaching and kind of a normal if there is a normal job right come home at yes. night, so that's a little bit better than some that go on you know maybe off to europe or other parts of the world for six months or more right that is true yeah like since my wife and i got married which is is uh in in july of this come of this year will be seven years that we've been married um you know we we have been blessed that i haven't deployed and and i thank god for that for sure and um you know, my next duty duty location is a place that's a, a high op tempo. So, you know, you know, I pray that I'm not deployed, but I but at the same time, I'm I am in the United States Army, so I have to be you know prepared for the possibility of it when I get there um, next month. So we'll see when I get there. Are you still going to be teaching in the next one? Or no, that's a whole new job. No, I, yeah. I don't know specifically what role I will be fulfilling when I'm there, but but it's you know likely not to be a teaching role unless um, unless I'm involved in the the culinary arts program at that installation because every every United States Army installation has a culinary arts program. the The way it works is they they take uh, an assessment of all the culinary arts specialists from the installation 
and they kind of go through a gauntlet, if you will, to see who it will comprise the the fourteen member team of culinary arts to represent that installation. So you know, I I don't want to I don't want to go in there with a, a a predetermined mindset that I'm going to be involved with that program. You know, I I would you know quite frankly I would like to say that I you know. I think I've I've staked my claim to to my experience up to this point in my career that I I would be a strong candidate to be involved with that program, but but I don't know if I will. What else could they have you do? Say you didn't make culinary. Is there other things that you train for? Do they retrain you for something new, or how does that work? Well, I I could I could be uh, put in a position to fulfill a duty assignment that's more administrative, you know, considering my, my, my tenure in the military and then my pay grade. So I could be put in an, in an administrative role or a leadership role in the, in like, in a military restaurant on, on that installation too. So, you know, I'll know more, you know, I'll know more next month and if we could revisit this in the future, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's tough not knowing. It is. Yeah. It's, it, it, you know, it, it's a little bit, you know, if you allow yourself to to allow it to be uh, nerve wracking and create anxiety, you know, it could be that way. But, you know, I'm just I'm at the point where in my career with my years of service where I'm like, I have to be mentally flexible and, and not focus too much on it. So. so that's a big difference between being the chef in the military and a chef as a civilian. I may lose my job, but I could probably know I'm my next job. I'm going to be doing something similar i want to be another chef right but when you're right case, correct you could be doing something totally different and have no control absolutely control mm-hmm. correct definitely so what are the educational opportunities then in the army or the military in general if someone doesn't know and they're listening i mean i'm sure well one just when you get out you have that what they call i guess the gi type bill there that you can go on and get other education but what is it when you're in there i mean you they could train you for a career for skills definitely it all boils down to the individual service member has to take onus of that so if you have a desire to expand your your civilian education the opportunity is afforded to you and and it's there's a lot of criteria that's based on to it so you know, you can't be a troublemaker. You can't have administrative actions of of legal issues. But as long as you don't have any legal issues of, you know, doing anything wrong in your professionalism conduct, um, the the army, the army, I, I can't say I can't speak to the other branches of service, but the army mm-hmm. has a has a program called Go Army Ed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, you can attend classes and you get $1,200 per year to attend classes at the university of your choice. And I mean, in this day and age, the possibilities and selections are endless, sure. like uh, a shout out to your institution. Uh, Johnson and Wales is actually one on the authorized list to, to attend classes. And I know, um, Johnson and Wales has a culinary arts online program. And, and that's just one example, but there, you know, there's tons of examples. So you just, you know, we have to gear towards what your interest is in, in whatever curriculum you want to study. Now, do they help you with that? Like some life planning or career planning when you go in? Because if you get someone that's maybe right out of high school, 18, they go in, you know, they could say, this is good. If you play your cards right and get on a path here and, and, and work it at the end, you could come out okay, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's there there's an immense amount of mentorship in in the military. Um, so you know the the people that are, are are intermediate and seniors that have have a lot of tenure in the military. It's it, the the concept and the ideals is to cultivate future leaders. So whenever whenever you get into a leadership position, it's really really embedded in the into the minds of all of us to reach back and help the people behind us catch up to you and and be your predecessor or be your successor excuse me mm-hmm. and did they help you with transition once you're on your way out yes absolutely and I, I can't speak to the whole aspect of that as of yet because I'm not quite there but there there is a transitional program of of preparing us for re-entering the civilian sector and Soon enough, I will, you know, be blessed with knowing that. Right. 
that's really interesting. And I know there's probably people out there with questions. And, and if someone did have a question specific to your you know, expertise that, you know, they have a question about the military or something like that, is there a way that they could reach you? Is there, is there a, you have a social media presence where they can get in touch with you to reach out and ask these type of questions? Uh, yes, sir, Chef. Um, I, I have a LinkedIn profile. Um, so uh, LinkedIn.com. And then forward slash uh, I N forward slash R Y A N A N I E L S E N and and I'm I'm more than willing to to answer any any questions of anybody that might contact me on there. So um, continuation of that. So my first name, middle initial, and last name it's Ryan A Nielsen N I E L S E N. Great. And what I'll do is I'll put that in the show notes in the description below. So if someone you know, wants to just click on that, I'll make it as a link and then they can go and find you and reach okay. out to you. And that would be that would be great. And thank, thank you for offering that because I'm sure there's people listening that are going to have questions that you, know, you could maybe answer or help them or guide them. Absolutely. So you mentioned you have a wife and two beautiful daughters. Now, how did you meet your wife? Is, is she in culinary? Was she in the military? How did you guys meet? My wife definitely loves to cook, um, you know, based on her her family upbringing. However, she's not in culinary professionally. Uh, my wife is uh, by education and, and a professional trade. She is a nurse. Um, she earned her licensed practitioner nurse certification. Then she earned an associate's degree in nursing, and then she earned a bachelor's degree in nursing. And then over the course of us getting married and, and having children, it um, life, you know, threw a bit of a curveball at her. Um, and and uh, she innately, she's a teacher and, and she loves to educate as many people in any way, shape or form that she can. And uh, she's recently become a third grade teacher at, at a school and uh, it, it's a, it's a recent event and she's really enjoying it and she's, you know, absorbing it and, and seeing what that might propel her to um, there. There aren't any expectations at this point, but she's really enjoying the, the journey thus far. Good for her. Wow. Two, two great careers there. <laughs> you know, she's a very giving person. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So before we wrap up though, i is there any last minute advice or guidance that you want to leave with the listeners? Something you want to tell them about, whether it's this career, whether it's military, whether it's just in life in general, anything you could share? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, life in general, my advice is this, is don't always listen to respond. You know, whatever communication that you're involved with the people, you have to listen to be able to process it and comprehend and understand what's being conveyed to you. And then respond appropriately. Don't just respond because you want to hear yourself talk. Uh, you know, a lot of us as human beings, we have a bad habit of that. And, you know, we just want to hear ourselves talk because we think our ideas are the best. And, um, you know, you, you have to be able to, to react to the people that you, you have the opportunity to impact, you know, what's most appropriate to them. And, and you have to try to impact people to make them better versions of themselves and not better versions of you. And, um, you know, whatever it is you want to, whatever it is you want to do in your life, you know, find, find that fire within yourself and that passion and go after it and, and don't ever quit. So whatever you love to do, you know, find that. And ideally, you know, it's at a younger age. And then when you find it, capitalize on it and learn as much as you can and be a lifelong learner. Don't, don't ever stop learning because you know what? Until until we close our eyes and God takes them home, you know, you have to be able to strive to learn as much as you can. And that way you can impact as many people as you possibly can. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode. And I want to first thank you, Ryan, for coming on the show on this podcast and sharing your culinary school story with all of us and the listeners. And really appreciate your time and your honesty and your insight. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm honored and privileged to be here. Thank you. All right. Enjoyed our chat. You take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. 
Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you. And that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.